blue areas. It's more, but, at any, but the West Bank is really, I think, what we... Because Israel will give up Gaza, as we've already, we can already see. Gaza is pretty much untenable and, and fairly much unimportant for Israel. So we really have to focus on the West Bank. So that what areas A and B did was to create the contours of this Palestinian Bantustan. The dark brown areas here of area A are supposedly the areas that are under exclusive Palestinian control, both civil and security. Now the entire, all the occupied territories are only 22% of the country. You know, this is something I'll just kind of mention that, that's interesting. You know, we're always trying to defend ourselves in terms of Barack's generous offer. Why his generous offer of 85%, 90%, 95% wasn't acceptable to the Palestinians. And I think there's a very good reason why, because they weren't a, you know, it's not a matter of territory, it's a matter of viability. Do you, can you get a state that has territorial contiguity, that has control of its borders, that has an economic potential, that has the ability to address the refugee issue, for example, uh, that has real sovereignty, and Barack's generous offer, although it looked good on paper if you didn't know the map, in fact denied the Palestinians those essential elements of sovereignty and viability. But we never hear about the Palestinians' generous offer, which some people like Edward Said always felt was much too generous. And that was that already in 1988, when the Palestinians declared their independence in Algiers, and again in 1993, at the beginning of the Oslo peace process, the Palestinians recognized Israel within what we call the Green Line, within what's in fact the 1949 armistice line between Israel and the West Bank. By doing so, by doing so, the Palestinians then gave up political claim to 78% of the country. In other words, in 1947, in the UN partition, uh, the Jews got this lighter area in here. The Jews, although they were only a third of the population, got about 54% of the land. And the Arabs got uh, 46%. After the war in 1948, Israel had conquered already, Naim talked about this last night, had conquered half of the land that had been partitioned to the Palestinians. So today Israel, Israel occupies 78% of the country and the occupied territories comprise only 22%. So, at the beginning of the Oslo peace process, the Palestinians already gave up political claim to 78% of the country, and then they said, you know what, we will make peace with you in return for the 22% of the country that remains. Which is a pretty generous offer. To which Israel replied, no. And one of the problems that the Palestinians have faced ever since, they're not very good poker players, I think, is that once the 78% was taken out of the negotiations, that's not an issue now. And the 22% become 100% of what we're negotiating, right away, uh, uh, it was made clear to the Palestinians, hey, you don't get 100% in negotiations. You know, if you get 100%, what are we negotiating about? So then the whole dynamic until today has been how much of that... 22% can the Palestinians retain. See, so the whole dynamic has been won. So you even see it with this Geneva initiative, the, the liberal Geneva initiative that was announced a couple, a couple months ago. It was never a thought, even though they were thinking about justice and how can we really address Palestinian needs and how do we talk to them. There was never a suggestion that, wait a minute, you know, there's another people here of equal or greater numbers than we are Maybe instead of the 22%, maybe we should give them 25%. Maybe we should take a little bit out of Israel and add it and make it a little bit more. That wasn't even considered. The entire thrust of Geneva, which is the best you'll get, 
was, again, how much of the 22% will the Palestinians get? And they wouldn't get it all. At any rate, at any rate the, um, um, the idea then was, I think, to, uh, to carve out an area that the Palestinians could get that would not endanger Israeli control. And the contours are areas A and B, in which area A, area A then, which is under Palestinian control, comprises the main Palestinian cities. Area A is 18% of the West Bank. So what we might say is after seven years of negotiations, between 1993 and 2000, all the Palestinians eked out from Israel was 18% of 22%. That was it. Then you get around areas A, you get what's called area B, which is under Palestinian civil control, but not military control. All the rest of the West Bank, all the gray area, is area C, which is 60% of the West Bank. Until today, under full Israeli control, and here's where you have all the settlements, all these blue dots, so that today the Palestinians are confined to 64 different islands. Now keep in mind, the West Bank is an area the size of Delaware, with four times the population of Delaware. So imagine Delaware divided into 64 islands in which you need military permission to travel from island to island. That's the reality, but this first element then of areas A and B defines the contours of this Palestinian Bantustan. The second element uh, in what I call the matrix of control is, uh, I don't know if you can see this from, from there, but all these little dots, what we call the closure, the closure. In other words, ironically, at the beginning of the Oslo peace process, a permanent closure was laid over the West Bank and Gaza, meaning that Palestinians needed military permission to go, come into Israel, but increasingly military permissions and, and obstacles in terms of internal movement as well. There are today, if you can see all these dots, there are today about 120 permanent checkpoints uh, obstructing Palestinian movement and what's interesting if you can see is that they're not along the border which you would expect if this was a security situation the vast majority of checkpoints are clustered inside between all the various islands in addition to that you have hundreds of earthen mounds that permanently close the entrances to most of the cities, towns, and villages of the West Bank. And in addition to that, you get at any particular day more than 100 spontaneous checkpoints, what we call flying checkpoints, so that on any particular day, Palestinians face more than 700 obstacles to their movement around this little area the size of Delaware. Now, what the closure does, among other things, is that it gets the Palestinians used to living inside these little islands. The little islands become your whole world. Now, after more than 10 years, there is no Palestinian, let's say in Hebron, that would dream of going to a wedding in Bethlehem. Especially if the wedding's at night. But you wouldn't dream about going to a wedding because of all the dangers and the hassles if you could get through the closure at all and the permits and so on. Christian populations in Ramallah used to marry Christians in, in Jerusalem and Christians in Bethlehem. That's absolutely impossible today. Or if it could happen, if you're, if you're living in Ramallah and your daughter marries a fellow from Bethlehem, it could very, very easily be 10 years or more before you'll see her again. Not to mention your grandchildren. There are people in Bethlehem, and you can walk from downtown Jerusalem to Bethlehem in about a, an hour or so. There are people in Bethlehem, a whole new generation that's never been to Jerusalem. 
So what that means then is that the Palestinians begin to internalize these little islands that they're living in. So in terms of marriage patterns, residency, commercial transactions, who you do business with, your whole world becomes reoriented to these little tiny islands. And in a way, it becomes something... Um, I'm losing all the, the wires here. Uh, it becomes, you know, there's that story that most of you probably know about the goat, the woman and the goat. Uh, it's a famous Jewish story where a woman comes to a rabbi and says, Rabbi, my, my house is small. I got my kids, my husband. It's very crowded. What can I do? And the rabbi says, you know what? Bring a goat into the house. So she says, okay, you know, and the rabbi says, she brings the goat in. She comes back to the rabbi and says, rabbi, it's terrible. This goat in the house, you know, it's even. He says, you know what, bring a cow into the house. So she brings a cow into the house. She comes back, she says, rabbi, it's intolerable, it's terrible. What can I do? He says, you know what, take the goat and the cow out. So she takes out, she comes back, she says, rabbi, what a big house I have. I have so much room, so much space, it's wonderful, thank you. That's exactly the analogy. In other words, you lower the expectations among the Palestinians to a point that once Israel decides, as it's doing these days, unilaterally, to impose a Bantustan, to say, okay, you're going to get 40% of the West Bank, but you'll be able to travel freely from Hebron to Jenin, <gasps> Palestinians will say, wow! What a big space we have. It's wonderful. I haven't been to Janine for 10 years. So you lower expectations so that you don't even expect to get the whole West Bank. If you get certain islands that are connected enough that you can go from one to the other, that's fine. So that I think that's the idea, the logic behind, uh, behind the closure. The third element in this matrix of control uh, is the settlement blocks. This is something that we tend to miss in our analyses that are, that's very important. Israel does not talk about settlements. Rather, it's consolidated the blocks of settlements that it wants to retain strategically into what it calls settlement blocks. We have to understand the idea of blocks, especially now, because in yesterday's paper, this was what it was all about. What Sharon is now asking Bush to do, and this week Elliot Abrams is going to Israel to work this out, is the deal that if Israel gets out of Gaza, not all of Gaza, that's also something that's kind of people have missed, the northern settlements in Gaza remain. But if Israel gets out of most of Gaza, then Israel is asking the United States, because everything that Israel does have to, has to have the American agreement approval, Israel is asking to have the settlement blocks annexed. And if it can annex the settlement blocks, then it can unilaterally give up areas A and B, and you have the creation of the Palestinian Bantustan. In other words, just these days, right now as we're speaking, this whole enterprise is coming, to, is coming to a head, is coming to a conclusion. So as you can see, the settlement blocks then define the areas that Israel wants to keep permanently. Now there are seven of them. There's the Jordan Valley block. Now in fact, after the war in Iraq, where Iraq is less of a strategic threat, and Jordan, which Jordan has had a peace agreement with Israel now for, for a number of years, Israel could conceivably give up the Jordan Valley block. Because what labor is trying to tell the Likud is, we agree with the Bantustan idea, for sure, but we've got to make it look cosmetically good enough that we can sell it. So what labor is saying is, you know what, let's give up the Jordan Valley, We'll give the Palestinians an area in here. It fleshes it out. It makes it look a little bit better on the map. So instead of 40%, we could give up 60% of the West Bank. We could give up 80% of the West Bank. Still keep control, but it looks much better. So when you open the Seattle newspaper and you see a map and says Israel's given up all of Gaza and 70% of the West Bank, you know, people say, you know what, good enough. 
You start what Israel is counting on.